And welcome back to our Book Talk segment of the program. Real pleasure right now to welcome a man uh, on the show uh, that has written a, a really great book about, uh, of course, the chairman of the board. We're talking about Frank Sinatra, a man who uh, knew him very well. He worked with him for a very long time. And uh, the book is called Sinatra and Me in the Wee Small Hours. And uh, Tony Opetisano uh, was Frank's road manager for uh, many years uh, toward the end of his, uh, I guess, 10 or 15 years at the end of his uh, performing life. Also worked with the great Don Rickles. We'll find out about that as well. But uh, Tony joined us by telephone today from out in uh, California. And, uh, Tony, it's great to see you or to actually talk to you again. We met uh, uh, as we were talking before we went on the air back in, I think, 2004 when you and Dina Martin came through our area. So uh, good to talk to you again. Yeah, the pleasure is mine, Doug. I really re- I remember that. It was very uh, it was very gratifying that you had us on then, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased and honored to have, to have to be on the show again now. We, we had uh, you had you in. I, I did a, a talk show during the day, and I did a kind of a big band uh, jazz show at night. And uh, I remember you all came in the studio for uh, two hours and uh, playing a lot of Dean and Dina's music and Frank Sinatra, of yeah. course. And you're all dancing around the studio. I have pictures of that. So uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and Les Great Brown Jr., time. he was in with us too, because Les was leading the band uh, at Van yeah, Wezel when was, they came through Sarasota. He, he was he was doing the tour with us exactly one the the inaugural tour of Dina's show that we we put together absolutely. Now was that the first time? That was the first year that she was going on doing like a tribute to her dad show, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, and it was something that uh, she she wanted to do, and she wasn't convinced that that it would work. I said, "What are you kidding?" I said, first of all, you saw what we did. I had just produced uh, a show similar for Lorna Luft. All right, called songs my mother taught me, and I said, "You know, we can put a couple. I could put a couple of duets together for you and Dad." I said, "I think you'll have a lot of fun with it," and uh, it I know. worked. She and she's out doing it still. I tell you, I'm sure you watch it too. She does the show on uh, Friday afternoons uh, on Facebook and YouTube, but it's unbelievable mm-hmm. amount of views. She's like top of the charts of uh, online views, so she's doing very well with that. Yeah, she is. She she ended up exactly where I figured she would. Yeah, and I'm happy for her. Yeah, good good to have her. Consider her a, not only a, a radio friend but a personal friend as well. Uh, nice people. So and, and you yeah, as well. I mean, you're you're part of that now, thank and you. we're happy to talk. Before we get into the book, I gotta t- tell you, I, I read through the book and I enjoyed it, but I did not know. I knew you're from New York, but I did not know that you grew up at least part of your childhood in Floral Park, is where I grew up. So good to talk to another Floral Park person. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, well, I graduated from Swan. Monica High School in Floral Park. I was Absolutely. going to guess because uh, Floral Park Memorial was not around, I believe, when you lived there. So I was guessing it was Swanica. So it was. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Great school. Great school. Great people. Do you remember what street you lived on in Floral Park, if, if, you, if you don't mind uh, saying? I, I actually, I actually, I lived in Franklin Square. Okay. Uh, on Catherine Avenue. Catherine, okay. No, right. know the area yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I grew yeah. up from Floral Park, just uh, about a mile away from Belmont. Every, I always have to tell people it's a mile away from Belmont, then they know where it is. <laughs> yeah, well, when you remind them of the racetrack, then all of a sudden, exactly. Yeah, For people say, well, I sort of heard, but once you say Belmont, okay, we're on the border of Queens anyway, so, yeah. Well, right. Well, well, you don't meet too many people from Floral Park around. There are some famous people. I think John Williams, the great uh, composer. I believe it's yep. from Floral Park. Ray Heatherton, a uh, great radio and Broadway guy. I work with him. So uh, there are a few mm-hmm. of us. Or you prove yourself. Now, I'm not putting myself <laughs> in that category. but uh. <laughs> Yes, you are. You should be. You deserve it. Well, let's let's start with the book a little bit. Uh, and again, it's called Sinatra and Me in the Wee Small Hours. As I mentioned in the intro, you uh, uh, met Frank uh, in your early 20s in New York. You were a musician and, and a singer. And uh, mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that. We won't get, tell all the stories. We want people to buy the book. But you met him very early in your uh, career, didn't you? Yes, I did. I uh, I became aware of uh, uh, of the club uh, called Jilly's by listening to to my in my opinion one of the greatest live albums ever to this day, Sinatra at the Sands with the Basie Orchestra. Right. And in that he during his bottle, he kept talking about Jilly's and Jilly's and Jilly's. I said, you know, when I'm old enough to to start gigging in the city, I got to check it out, and I did. And uh, befriended uh, Jilly's older brother, Uncle Frank, who ran the place in Jilly's absence, and Jilly. For the for the people who are listening who may not be aware, Jilly Rizzo was pretty much the brother Sinatra never had. Yeah. They were that they were that close. And uh, long story short, Jilly put his arm around me and became a mentor. And he said, "You know, I think you'd be a good fit to meet the old man." And he was very careful who he did that with. And um, in um, December of 1972, um, he found the right occasion to put us together. 
And uh, it, it turned out to be not only an introduction, he insisted that I sit in with the band and play that night for Frank. And we were there till almost seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And Frank actually sang a song with me, which almost caused me to drop the guitar, which right. is a whole other story. But uh, we clicked, and Frank was in the middle of his self-imposed retirement, as he used to call it, where he stepped away from the industry for a bit to spend more time with family and friends. And then he told me in later years that another part of the reason was that he he didn't feel that uh, he might he might not be relevant to my generation. And by bringing me around, and I was invited to bring a my friends around who were other musicians and singers and these guys were all hanging on Frank's every word. So that, that coupled with boatloads of letters from what I understand, at least come out of retirement and do an album. Uh, he felt, you know what, maybe I still have something to contribute. Came out of retirement in the fall of 73 and never looked back. It's almost hard to believe, uh, you know, if you didn't read the, <coughs> excuse me, the history of, of uh, Frank, uh, that uh, he would have felt that he was irrelevant because uh, his records have, have always been around. He's always been on radio, at least since, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit a little bit younger than you, but not that much. But, but I always heard him growing up as a kid. But I guess he felt yeah. uh, with the rock and roll at the time, he, he just wasn't getting, uh, getting out there, right? Getting yeah, through. That, that, that's, that's exactly. He, was, he wasn't sure that, uh, that his audience – you know, uh, the demographic was as large as it once was. And uh, he's thinking, okay, so, you know, the 25 and unders are probably maybe maybe half of them, if I'm lucky, are listening to me. Right. But uh, he found out different. And uh, like I said, he came out of retirement in 73, never looked back. And then, you know, when we did the, the duets album, uh, one of the things that just absolutely thrilled him to death was he... <laughs> He held up the paper at the billboard, and he says to me, I can't believe this. I'm almost 80 years old, and I knocked Pearl Jam out of That's the first right. place. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, though, they came out early 90s, and uh, uh, duets one, and then, of course, duets two. And you talk uh -huh. about that in the book, how those were put together. And uh, yeah. and like you said, they, they almost, uh, I'm not sure if Top 40 stations played them. At the, there wasn't any really Top 40 then, but, I mean, they were played on not just jazz stations. They were played all over the place. Across the board. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the younger the younger uh, people that he had, and they were all thrilled to be duetting with him, and uh, just uh, I'm I'm glad that uh, that the record was the success that it that it turned out to be. We all anticipated that it would, and uh, you know, especially that it was the last thing that he ever recorded. I don't know. Did he predate a little bit the the Nat King Cole and Natalie Cole duet, or was it? No. As a matter of fact, I I kind of I kind of used that. I sensed that he was having some apprehension, and when we were discussing, he said, "You know, I just don't understand." He says, "If I'm not going to be in the studio with the other artists," he said, "You know, how the hell is this going to work out? You can't you can't recreate that chemistry." Because up till then, any duet he ever did, whether it be on record with Keely Smith or yeah. or live on television shows like with Dinah Shore and people. Uh, you know, he liked to do things in the moment and have the orchestra surround him and have the other artist, you know, right there in the studio at the same time. And I said, well, Frank, you know, due to scheduling uh, people touring around the world, uh, it's hard to have, you know, everyone's schedule coincide where they could make it work that way. I said, in addition to that, a lot of the younger artists are not accustomed to recording the way you do. They go in and they lay down the rhythm tracks and then they go in a week later and do the strings and a week later and do the brass and three weeks later they go into an isolation booth and lay down the vocal. I said, so when you get an artist that's accustomed to doing that and they walk into legendary Studio A at Capitol Records and see that there's a 60-piece orchestra and then they look across the room and see your face, I says, <laughs> I literally said to him, you know what you're going to get? Dust is what you're going to get. So he laughed. I said, however... Uh, I said, if you recall, we were sitting by the pool down in Palm Springs, and we heard that great record with you know, Natalie Cole doing Unforgettable. We said, oh, yeah, what a terrific record. I said, well, Frank, it's 1992. I said, how long has Nat been dead? And he looked at me puzzled, and then it registered. He said, oh, my God, you're, if they could put her voice at a dead guy. I said, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, in addition to that, I said, the man who engineered that album, his name is Al Schmidt. Right. He says, yeah. I said, and Al Schmidt's engineering yours along with Phil Ramon. He says, oh, my God. So I said, you know, it is very, very possible. And so it's, it's ironic you bring that up because that's what that's what I used to help convince him that it was possible to do it. Yeah, I know you talk about it in the book and just from you know hearing interviews with him before that he loved 
And really, the only way he wanted to have record is if he kind of stood in the middle of the orchestra in the recording studio, and it was like a live performance in a sense. He, he did not yeah. like uh, doing it, you know, yeah. track by track. No, and he was not a big fan of uh, well, punch in and fix that, and punch in and fix that. You do it again. You, you did exactly. Exactly. If you can't do it in one take, you don't belong in the studio. Right. <laughs> I was just watching yeah. that documentary. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube. The one they did, CBS did, I think it was 65, where they show a lot of them doing uh, a recording session, and, and you get a sense of that in that documentary. Yeah, and he actually used to he actually used to invite people so that he had a little bit of a gallery so that it was almost right. uh, as though he was singing to an audience sometimes as well. You would think uh, somebody as, you know, as uh, much a perfectionist as Frank wouldn't want people there kind of distracting him, but he, he kind of thrived on that, didn't he? Wanting people around to listen to him, uh, friends. He really, he, yes, he really did. Yeah. He really did. And he, uh, he respected his audience more than anything else in the world. And that's, that's part of the reason that he, when he decided to walk away, he just felt that he wasn't living up to his own standard of professionalism. And he said, my audience deserves better than that. That's who paid the freight to get me wherever it is that I am. And uh, I want to walk away while I'm still doing a job that I can be proud of. Talking with uh, Tony Opetisano, better known uh, to his friends as Tony O. And the name of the book is Sinatra and Me in the Wee Small Hours, just out uh, a few weeks ago, doing uh, a very good business from what I understand. And well, let's kind of move ahead a little bit, Tony. Uh, you met Frank in the early 70s, and, uh, of course, he came out of retirement. So uh, what, was the, uh, what was the first uh, time that he said, well, you want to go work for me? <laughs> that must have been interesting. <laughs> you know, it was uh, it, our our history. Um, shortly after we met, um, I, I was continuing to play clubs in New York, but then that was beginning to wane. Uh, a lot of the great clubs were folding. Carson right. moved the Tonight Show to L.A., so I said, you know, I got to go where the work is. So I came out to California in '76, and I and I maintained a friendship through Jilly. Uh, I didn't see him that frequently because I was on the road then as well, but we'd run into each other in Tahoe or on a night off. If I was working in LA, I'd go up to Vegas. When I gave up my performing career in the early eighties, because the music industry completely turned its back on the great American songbook and right. jazz and that kind of stuff. And unless you were an established artist, it was very getting very difficult. Uh, so I started producing TV and, uh, Jilly and I were doing more and more things together. And so it, it, uh, by osmosis, I was spending more and more time with Frank, especially down the desert. And then, um, uh, Jilly ended up having some legal issues, which caused him to not be able to go places and not be able to do certain things. And Frank would say, listen, if you're not busy such and such a time, you know, how do you feel about coming with me and maybe, you know, or meet me up in Vegas or whatever. And that was, uh, mid to late eighties. And then when Jilly unfortunately was killed in that car crash, yeah. Uh, that's when it became kind of a permanent thing where Frank literally said to me, and we both lost probably one of the best friends we'll ever have in our, in our life. And, you know, it would be great if you and I could somehow figure out a way of, uh, working together. And so, uh, I put all my TV and, and other stuff, uh, aside and was on the road with him for the last three years of his performing career. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, from 92 to 95. What was we get back to Frank a little bit? But was Jilly kind of a misunderstood uh, person? Uh, you didn't really hear a lot of you know great things about him from the media, Jilly, and of course, doesn't mean anything because the media can be wrong, as we know. But was he misunderstood? Yeah, absolutely. They created a persona of Jilly that was 180 degrees from the man that that I knew. He was uh, he was a he was a sort of an imposing figure physically. Big but guy, right? Mad, I mean, but he, tall but, guy. But he was in. He was a tall guy, yeah. big, wide guy, but he was an absolute sweetheart and, uh, and, uh, not, not very book learned. Uh, however, uh, Jilly could give a postgraduate dissertation, uh, on, on street smarts. He mm-hmm. was a, he was a very, very bright. He used to say stuff that would crack us up. He would watch, <laughs> he would watch some make a co- somebody make a complete fool of himself. And he would look at me. Here's a man who never made it past the sixth grade. He'd look at me and he'd say, you know, Tone, I think common sense is the least common thing. I said, you're absolutely right, Jilly. <laughs> <laughs> very, very profound. <laughs> yeah, he was a char- quite a character and completely dedicated to his family and uh, like Frank, uh, things that they had in common and uh, uh, absolutely dedicated to his, his friendship with Frank. When he first befriended Frank, 
uh, it was at a point in Frank's career where he, pardon the pun, couldn't get arrested. Yeah. I mean, he was down. Everyone had let him go. His early early fifties, right? Dropped him. Early fifties. His <laughs> record label dropped him. He had no representation, and uh, his voice. He had had a a, 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 a hemorrhage, and he wasn't uh, he wasn't able to sing for a good eight months. And uh, uh, Jilly became his friend. And uh, as Frank used to say, he said he was my friend, Frank, not Frank Sinatra. Right. So there was no benefit in being Frank Sinatra's friend at that point. And uh, that, that's that's why the friendship made so meant so much to him, because he knew he was there to be his pal, not looking for what Frank could do for him. Yeah. Well, that's the same question, I guess, about Frank, because I, I think there's a huge misunderstanding a lot about Frank now. A lot of tumult and a lot of self-imposed uh, things that he did. I mean, he admitted to it. But I think a lot of people have a misrepresentation of uh, Frank Sinatra as a person, too, don't they? And yes, your book kind of clears and that that's, up. That's that's what I was. That's that was one of the goals in in writing the book was to was to pull back the curtain and give the world an opportunity to take a look at the man that I knew and I had the privilege to know. He was just a regular guy, very personable, very. Very caring, very, very generous, philanthropic, and uh, dedicated father. And he was just, uh, like he said, everybody puts their, their pants on one leg at a time, including me. And mm. he was uh, a really down-to-earth, really down-to-earth man with great familial values. Yeah, and you talk about it in the book, too. Uh, I didn't realize uh, the difficult birth that he had. I mean, the, uh, his mother, I guess, was a small woman, and he was a large baby. I didn't realize that till I, till I read your book. Yeah. And, and that may have had something to do with some behavioral things later on, right? That's that's what that's what the doctors had said in, in later years as well. And, uh, um, you know, because they, listen, they, 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 they took him out of his mother. They had to use forceps, right. and it tore, up, it tore up the side of his head. It, it tore half of his earlobe off the left ear. It tore his neck. And uh, he wore those scars very proudly until the late 70s where Barbara finally convinced him to have some plastic surgery. Yeah. And uh, But if it wasn't for his grandmother, as he said, they, they, they put me aside and were trying to save my mom. My grandmother picked me up, stuck me under some cold water, That's and right. slapped me around. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. It's amazing when you think, very rare at the time uh, of any family, particularly an Italian family, he's an only child. I guess the, obviously the mother couldn't have any more kids, but it's interesting. Yeah, that had that had something to do with it. In addition, she, uh, his mom and dad were very busy people. I mean, not in addition to her being a midwife, she was also a Democratic ward boss. Right. And, uh, and was doing a lot. And his dad... Uh, in addition to being a, 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 a captain in the fire department, also owned a bar, yeah. and so uh, and that that contributed to to Frank uh, liking to stay up late, and and uh, part of the reason that he and I got to be so close, and and he shared so many things with me because uh, uh, he and I would stay up drinking till six, seven. Sometimes we'd watch the sun come up, <laughs> but it, that it all had to do. It stemmed back from being. In, from his childhood when he said the three of them would be having dinner. He says, and I, I would pray the phone wouldn't ring because I knew that one or both of them was going to be leaving probably yeah. for the rest of the night and I'd be all alone. Yeah. I've heard that over the years. And again, you, you talk about it in the book, uh, being an only child. He, he hated being by himself. He, he did not enjoy that at all. Right. That's why he always wanted to have late night evenings with people, friends, one yeah, or two or many. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's, that's why, as I like to say, I'm, I'm <laughs> on the road after the show almost uh, every night was like new year's eve you yeah. know 12 or 14 people for dinner and but then again as i said one one by one people would peel off and wander away they'd use an excuse they're going to the bathroom or something yeah. and never come back <laughs> <laughs> well, i know and dean you know, didn't really like just doing and... that didn't dean him and he wanted to get up early and play golf so he didn't like to stay up late with frank exactly exactly dean did that as a matter of fact at one of his own anniversary parties i don't know if you know the story <laughs> no, or no. not well, it, it, he was married to Jeannie, his last wife, Jeannie, Jeannie uh, not his last wife, she, his next to last. He tried to re remarry Jeannie after he I heard that. that. Yeah, they never did. They were going to yeah. get, in an interview, no. he said they were going to get remarried, but they never did. Yeah. yeah, she couldn't bring herself to do it, but they were as close as though, as though they were married again. But at any rate, they, they had a big party at their home in Bel Air. You know, they tented the tennis court and they had an orchestra and the whole thing and, you know, white glove service and all of that stuff. And Frank and I uh, wandered away so Frank could have a, a cigarette. And 
all of a sudden we saw police cars pulling up in front of the house. And Frank said, what the hell is that? So he walks out front and the sergeant's walking up the walk and he says, Sergeant, what's going on? He said, well, Mr. Sinatra, he says, I hate to tell you this. He said, but we got, we got a call disturbing the peace. And uh, Frank said, who the hell would make a call on this house at disturbing the peace? At any rate, he got around to talking privately with the sergeant. And the sergeant says, well, I hate to tell you, Mr. Sinatra, but the call came from inside the house. <laughs> so Frank said, oh, my God. Okay, thanks, Sergeant. <laughs> So the sergeant walks away, and he walks up to Dean's room, and Dean is laying on the couch on his bed with the golf club on his shoulder watching the late news in his pajamas already, and it's like <laughs> about 20 after 11. And Frank walks in, and Dean turns around and says, hey, Pally. Frank says, I'll give you hey, Pally. What the hell did you do? And, and Dean says, hey, they ate, they drank. Let them go home. I, I got to get up and play golf in the morning. <laughs> he called the police on his own party. That's great. <laughs> now they they got along pretty well. I mean, I know there were some stories at the end when they were doing that last tour that they may have had a rift. But what do you know about that? Uh, actually, it was more along the lines of Frank and Sam were trying to get Dean out of the funk that he fell into. You know, when Dino was killed, right? And so they convinced him to do the Together Again tour. He really didn't want to do it. And then being on stage, he didn't feel like he had the energy level that matched Sammy and, and Frank, and he felt like he wasn't pulling his weight. And so he, he, I think it was like the fifth show, they were in Chicago, and he said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to go back to L.A., and I'm going to check into the hospital. I'm not feeling so good, and uh, that's what he did. But uh, one of the uh, things that have been perpetuated is that they never spoke again. They were very close. They remained very close. As a matter of fact, I had the privilege of putting Frank on the phone with Dean about 14 hours before he passed away. Oh, right. And we had we would have dinner together occasionally in Beverly Hills. Uh, so they did continue to stay in touch. They were like brothers, the three of them. Yeah. You were, not, nothing was going to come between them. No. Although Dean was a much more introverted person, from what I've heard and talking to Dean, and, and Frank was more of an extroverted, so that there was that difference, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dean. Dean was uh, he was always a loner, and uh, and and you know he he liked to to stay home and and watch westerns. Yeah, right. Yeah, heard that, <laughs> just yeah. the way he just the way he was. Yeah. He wasn't you know part of that ring a ding ding world, uh, especially in his older years. Yeah. But but he well he had worked so much. Deep. I mean you can't blame Dean for saying hey I've had enough. I mean he he worked yeah. a ton. So uh, it's not yeah. like he made it look so easy. And Dina talks about that that people yep. think he was lazy, but he was not. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Uh, oh. and, 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 and that was all an act. And oh. he was ter terrific. At, even with the booze, Martinelli's apple juice went right. a long way in his glass. <laughs> yeah, Dean didn't drink <laughs> to the extent that, you know, he joked about it. He'd have a drink, I guess, after a show or maybe two, but he, he was not always drunk. No, he started, he started, he started drinking that, I guess the heavy, the heaviest was, was after, after, after his know, son passed. I know he went to that restaurant and, every night, didn't he? An Italian restaurant someplace? And yeah, he by went himself. To, there, there was La Familia. Then, then when La Familia went away, then he had a booth at Da Vinci's, which is the last place we had dinner together. Myself, Frank, Dean, and his manager, Mort Viner had dinner together. Mm -hmm. uh, this is about a year before Dean passed away. We had dinner together at Da Vinci's. Yeah. Could, could you ever feel relaxed, Tony? I mean, uh, obviously you, you knew him well and you worked with him, but you look over across the table and Frank and, and Dean and, and Sammy when he was alive, I'm sure you all three ate dinner at that time as well. Can, can you feel, hey, part of the gang or do you always feel a little intimidated? <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 spent, I spent a fair amount of time in the company of Sam um, and, and the company of Dean, rarely the three of them, because I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't on the together again tour, mm -hmm. uh, at that point. Cause I was still heavily producing TV at the time, but, uh, I was in, the, I was in their company, but, um, it's funny. I, I, I was in the company of so many huge personalities on, on, on a regular basis, especially at Frank's home both in the desert, Beverly Hills, and at the beach. They, they, almost every time, there'd be Gregory Peck and Kirk Douglas and Jack Lemon and Larry Gelbart, George Slaughter, Sophia Loren, Angie Dickinson. They were regulars at the house, Dick and Dolly Martin. Right. Uh, it, it, 
every once in a while I would have to pinch myself and say, Greg, look at this. Gregory Peck is telling me a joke. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess after a while, it's like anything, uh, you know, what I do in radio, you, you get to meet these people and after a while you realize they're just people like anybody else and you, you put the celebrity away. You just talk to them like, I guess that's how you approached it, right? They're just people. Yeah. And, and again, but again, it, it was very gratifying to oh, be sure. in that, in that sphere, Sidney Poitier and people like that and be accepted and embraced by those people. Right. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, uh, yeah. It, it, it's, it's mind boggling when I look back at it now and, uh, you know, but again, you know, we didn't have cell phones that you could take a picture of back then. Right. <laughs> and and the last the last thing you wanted to do was be a civilian and pull out a camera at a party like. Oh that. sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think those were better times. I, I don't think we need all the, the cell phone, even though it's a great technology. I think it's too much. But uh, what yeah, are you going to do? I kind of agree with you. Kind of agree with you. Yeah. Tony, if you don't mind, we go over a little bit. I, I want to get into a little bit of work. You work with Don Rickles as well. Of course, Tony uh, was the road manager for Don for, for several years, and that's how uh, I met uh, Tony, of course, with, working with Dina and also uh, with Don Rickles uh, coming through our area here in Florida. Uh, how did you get with Don? I know Don and Frank were friends. Was that how you met? Well, Don, Don and I actually met uh, in 1980 uh, at Harrah's in Lake Tahoe. Uh, we were both under contract there as performers, and he was – he was working, as he used to like to put it, in the big room mm -hmm. with uh, with people like Sister Sledge and a very young Patty LaBelle. Oh yeah. And I had a quintet and was working in the State Line Cabaret and uh, went in to see his show on my night off. And uh, if you remember, towards the end of the show, he always used to introduce people in the audience. Sure, right. And I love that. Yeah. Old school. The, yeah. Well, the entertainment director evidently slipped him my name, and he said, listen, he's on the contract here, and we're trying to help his career, so he's going to be in the house tonight to introduce him. And he looked down at the paper, and he says, and we have a young man in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. He says, he says he's on the contract here at Harrison Lake Tahoe. And he says, uh, where are you, Tony? And he's looking at the name, and he's struggling with it. I swear <laughs> to God. He says, Tony, how do you pronounce this? Hop in the sauna? How do you pronounce this? <laughs> So that's how we met. We became friends, especially at that point when he heard that I already knew Frank and Jilly. We became friends. And in the early 1990s, uh, when the Desert Inn was becoming the Stars Desert Inn, and they were going to have a huge bash for Frank's 77th birthday, capitalizing on the two sevens, mm -hmm. Uh, Kirk Kerkorian at the time owned the place and was flying up a plane load of celebrities and bringing in every magazine television show to cover this big event. And uh, the subject came up, who do you want to have on the bill with you? And he said, I don't need polite laughter. I want someone who's going to create some tumult. And he thought for a long minute and he said to me, how about Bullethead? And that was one of his loving names sure. for Don, Bullethead. <laughs> So through some various machinations, because Don was on the contract at a different hotel, but the hotel was looking to close their showroom, uh, a deal was struck, and he ended up opening for Frank, and that was his inaugural engagement. They signed him, Burton Cohen, ended up signing him to be part of the, the uh, personnel at the Desert Inn. Oh, great. And so shortly thereafter, his manager, Joe Scandori, had passed away right. a couple of months before all of this happened. And so he said, listen, I know, you know, you're working with Frank. He said, but if you could see your way clear, I'd love to have you working with me. And I was working uh, uh, with a gentleman who lived down in Florida at the time. And we decided to work with Don together. And uh, maybe seven years or so before he passed away, Don saw fit uh, to make me his exclusive personal manager. So mm. I went from road manager to being manager, manager. Great. Um, yeah. So that's the way. It and I think the audience will be interested to know exactly what does a road manager do? I guess you do a little bit of everything, right? Just make sure the gig uh, goes through. Okay. You know, you, 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 you massage, you massage the gig until it's, uh, it's palatable to the entertainer and then you make the presentation and then you do all of the, the pre-work on the phone and, uh, uh, basically produce the show. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, and you're physically there with them on the road day and night. And, uh, um, it, it's, uh, it's, listen, in my opinion, it's a, it's a great gig because you know, every single job that it takes 
to do that show. Right. So you could fill in for any any number of the personnel that had to. Um, it's uh, and you control the show. You literally control the show. I got to the point where I was even doing Don's stage announcements because I wanted to make sure that he was indeed ready to go on the stage when they announced him because right. it happened one time. He, he he didn't even have his pants on yet, and we're in the dressing room here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> well, you're part of a great documentary, and also one you you did on Frank. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that for a minute as well. But you're in it, and they show you doing the stage announcement for Don. Yeah, and as I said, I did that just just for protection. I said this way they're not going to start the show without. As right. Frank used to say, they says, "Don't worry, they can't start the show without them." <laughs> That's right. I said, "Well, now they can't." <laughs> I tell you, as a kid again, growing up in New York, and once you're old enough to you know stay up and watch the Tonight Show, usually Friday nights, and you knew Don Rickles was going to be on, it was unbelievable what that man did. He was the greatest talk show guest. Forget about the live stage; that was great too. But the greatest talk show guest was Don Rickles. There's no doubt about it. You never knew what he was going to do, and he didn't either. No, that was, no, he that didn't. Was, that, was the, that was the beauty of it. You know, things would come into his head, out of his mouth, and completely gone. He had no recollection of whatever. It was just And it always worked. I mean, Johnny let him go off, and uh, whatever talk show he was on, Merv, Mike, whatever. And he knew how to do it. I mean, he, you know, he, you loved him because he was saying these things, but it was funny. You know, he ne never felt like it was an insult. No, and, and that was the thing. You know, he said, people know my heart. Um, it's... I never, no matter what I say, no matter how I say it, it never comes off mean spirited. And never. people know that. No. No. Always, always. Because no. he looked kind of cartoonish himself. So that, that helped. Uh huh. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and he picked on himself as much as he picked on everyone else. Yeah. Didn't hurt. Yeah. I've seen, I saw him, I guess, once or twice at Westbury Music Fair. I, I know you know that theater quite well uh -huh. in Long Island and a sure. few yeah. times down here. And, uh, you know, he was not a young man when I saw him his last show. Uh, but boy, he just still delivered with, uh, you know, knockout punches and, and people may yeah. have been surprised he would sing in his act, uh, and not too bad mm -hmm. either. <laughs> no, he felt, he felt that, you know, it had to, it had to be uh, an equally balanced show. He said, a show yeah. it, it, that's why I let, towards, towards the end of his career in Vegas, I mean, he was one of the few comedians that, that still had a full orchestra on stage with right. him. Right, right. You know, who did that? Very few people did yeah, that. He always do the I'm a nice guy number, and then he did, uh, he always did a tribute to Jimmy Cagney. I remember that. That was kind of interesting. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep, yep. And then, of course, and the, I, and, the and, ending and, song was very kind of poignant, like old old school showbiz, but it was great. Well, yeah, I'll trade you laughter for love. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he was quite a guy. Great, an, great an American guy. original. He was to comedy what Frank was to music, in my opinion. No doubt. An American, and, uh, an American original. Forged out of Long Island. Astoria, Long Island, I believe. Or Jackson Heights, I think. Is uh, Jackson from. Heights. Yeah. yeah, Jackson Heights. Something about being from New York, Tony, I think it gives us something. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a great foundation. It gives us a, a, uh, launch, a defense mechanism, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> that, too. <laughs> we'll wrap it up with Tony, because uh, we don't want to keep him too long, although we could talk for hours on, on Frank and, and uh, Don Rickles. But the name of the book is Sinatra and Me and the Sweet Small Hours, uh, just out. And uh, Tony, the, I guess it's available obviously everywhere. Any particular website you want to direct people to, or just the regular book uh, sites? I, I guess predominantly uh, the, the regular websites, predominantly Amazon. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, again very gratifying that it's doing so well, and and I'm glad that people are finally getting to get uh, a glimpse and an understanding of the man that I was privileged to know. Well, there's been so many books written about Frank, and uh, and and most of them probably wrong. Uh, I mean, you knew him so well, you couldn't write a book about him that wasn't accurate, I don't think. And that's what I promised him I would do. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it's being so well received. He would be very pleased. Tony O, great to, uh, again, chat with you again. I know it was about 17 years ago, but we will not make it that long again. And, and I guess things are opening up now. Are you going to be doing any uh, work with uh, Dina or anybody, or, or are you just kind of retired now? No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I turned my site, I turned my sites back onto full-time producing. I, uh, I have a couple of shows in the pipeline. I've got, uh, two feature films and one of them being a documentary, uh, that I'm doing, uh, rough right now. The working title is Rickles and Newhart, a Hollywood. Oh, romance. great. Yeah. And great, uh, great, great friendship yeah. they had. Yeah. That'll be fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Thanks again. I really appreciate the offer to come on the show, Doug. It's great talking with you as usual. 